Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, the title of a book can often tell you a lot about the story that's within those pages. In fact, sometimes the title is really obvious and you have an idea of what's going to happen. You can see those connections within the first few pages as you read the book. I recently finished a book entitled Sarah's Key. And a young girl, Sarah, had a key. And she and her brother would go into this secret cabinet built into the wall of their house and lock themselves in, thinking that their parents didn't know where they were. And one day they hear pounding and pounding on the door. And Michael, her brother, runs into um, the cabinet and Sarah has the key, but before she can follow him, the police come bursting into the house, and they arrest Sarah and her mom and her dad. And Sarah is left holding this key as the French police take, off, take the Jewish families to a concentration camp. Sarah's key remains in her hand while Michael remains locked in that cabinet. This you know within the first five pages of the book. Another one that I just finished is called Before We Were Yours. It's about a child's life before she was adopted. Another pretty obvious title. Before we were yours, before we were adopted, we had another life. But now I'm reading a book called Fooled Twice. Now, I know the reference. Um, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But I'm halfway through that book and I have yet to figure out what, why the author picked that title. Nothing in what I've read explains that. And that is some, somewhat how, sermon, or how books can go, where you have to figure out by the end of the book what, why that title. So I have a challenge for you. If you were going to name today's gospel, what would you give that for a title? I'll give you a couple of minutes to think, and I'm going to come and ask you a few what you would give today's gospel as the title. Anyone going to be bold and share? What would you name today's gospel reading? is seeing, believing, okay? Who else is bold enough to share? What would you name today's reading? I should have warned you this so you paid attention more to the gospel reading. <laughs> Some of us need proof. Okay, what else? Yeah, all the kids are going like this, so like I, I hope I don't call on them. <laughs> what would you name today's story? Somebody over here. Doubting? We often hear called the story of Doubting Thomas, don't we? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of things that happen in that story. And even the best title is never going to give you the whole breadth of what all happens in that story. We could probably place multiple titles, but yet we can really only choose one. So today I want you to think about is this story more about seeing and believing? Is it about doubting Thomas? Is it about Jesus appearing? I'd like you to consider that doubting Thomas is maybe a really limiting title. I think that Thomas gets a bum rap when we use that. I'd like to suggest that we t entitle it Encounters with Christ, Part 2. I was thinking of Close Encounters of the Second Kind, but I would have had to explain that to too many of the young people. So, so we'll go with Encounters with Christ, Part 2. So last week we heard Part 1. We heard the story that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in a tomb, and then on Easter morning was resurrected. 
No matter which gospel you read, though, it is evident that the disciples don't expect Jesus to be alive on that third day. Even though Jesus spoke numerous times right up until his arrest on Monday, Thursday, he spoke of his death and his resurrection. The women go to the tomb. For what purpose? To prepare the body for a proper burial. Remember, the body had just been put in the tomb until after the Sabbath was over. You don't go with spices and ointments to prepare a body for the tomb if you believe that the, bo that the body is going to become alive again. And after the women go, and they have an encounter with Jesus and they see Jesus, they go to the disciples and tell them Jesus is risen. And the disciples name their story an idle tale. You ladies are crazy. Nobody comes back from the dead. They too seem to forget that Jesus had promised a resurrection. Now that was Easter morning. Today's reading is the same day, but in the evening. And where do we find these disciples? Not at their homes, not spending time with their families, not at work, getting ready to close their shop for the day, not reeling in their nets or mending them or preparing to take them back out again. No, we find them in a locked room in a locked room because they were afraid. Jesus had promised that he would return. The women have told him, have told them we have seen Jesus, and yet they are locked in the upper room, afraid. And they are shocked when Jesus appears. There is fear at the sight of Jesus in their presence you can begin to see why doubting Thomas doesn't fit well for this story. Thomas isn't the only one doubting. In fact, you might even say that the disciples have moved beyond doubt into fear and into unbelief. In our modern world, we see doubting as an undesirable quality to have. Doubting implies insecurity. It implies weakness and even is a foreboding of disaster. If we say we are living in a time of an uncertain market, we are concerned with the trade of stocks and bonds. We are afraid that that is weak and it will hurt our economy. If we doubt somebody's story or promise, it means that it won't come true. Or we believe that it is exaggeration. That was the best movie I have ever seen. And yet, you don't believe it yourself until you've actually gone. This belief about what doubt means in our secular life leads us to believe that doubt does not have a place in our faith life. We fear doubt because we interpret it as unbelief. We think that if we as individuals have doubts within our faith, then our faith must be weak. If someone else dares to raise a question about faith, to doubt what Christians commonly believe, then they must not believe and they must be corrected. I would like to propose that doubting is actually an integral part of our faith story. In fact, if we are 100% totally convinced that our matters of faith are true, that's not belief. That's certainty, but that's not belief. Faith has always and will always be a place for questions and uncertainty. There's always the sense of the unknown in true faith. 
our Christian faith calls us to believe in things that cannot be fully explained or fully understood. In the book of Matthew, when a father comes to Jesus and asks that his son be healed, Jesus asks the man if he believes that this will happen. And the father's response is, I believe. Help my unbelief. The Apostle Paul encourages the Philippians to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. This implies that we don't unconditionally accept what we've been taught, but rather we struggle to make sense of Jesus' promises. We strive to learn what it means in our own individual lives to believe in Jesus and the promises, to believe that Jesus died on that cross, to believe that Jesus did come back alive, was resurrected from the tomb, to believe that our sins are forgiven. We seek to accept the promises of God, and we are called to spread this, spread this good news to others. So where does that leave us today? Are there times when you doubt the biblical story? Are there times when you doubt the strength of your own faith? Have you ever wondered if God is even out there or that God really cares about you? My first doubts about my faith probably came when I was about 17. I was in 11th grade and it was time to start looking for colleges. And I wondered if my faith was real or if I just did these church things because that's what my parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles believed. Did I truly believe in God or was I just going through the motions? I had not found a belief that worked for me. Another time when I doubted my faith was as I was studying to be a pastor. And in fact, I think every time I've taken a new call to a new congregation, I have this sense of, am I doing the right thing? Do I really believe that God is leading me to be the pastor of this congregation? There's a sense of, what the heck am I doing? So where does this leave you and I today? Because we have doubts. I don't deny that any of you don't have doubts about your faith at some time or another. But the tragedy of doubting is not the doubt itself, but rather the result of that doubt. Thomas proclaimed his doubt. He sought Christ. But it does happen in our society that doubt leads to rigid belief. Belief where we are not open to anyone else's ideas. We are closed to any other way that we can look at Christ in our faith. In fact, sometimes it becomes so rigid you get into a danger zone. Faith, this blind belief happens. For those of you who are old enough, you remember the Jonestown Massacre, where people blindly followed their religious leader, so blindly followed their religious leader that they drank poison and died. This is not belief. This is certainty, and certainty is when we don't have room for doubt. Jesus never calls us 
to blindly follow a rigid set of rules. In fact, Jesus invites the disciples to follow him before they even know what he's about, before they even know that there's anything to believe. Their belief only came through their experiences of living with Jesus and seeing the miracles and hearing his teaching. Belief comes when we raise questions, when we're be willing to be bold enough to express those questions and explore them together as the body of Christ. Rather than drive us away from our faith, doubt should strengthen our belief. It should drive us to the cross, to scripture, to the altar, to prayer, to study, to talking with others of faith, where we once again hear stories of faith and of belief. Doubt should drive us to the places where we can work out our faith, where we can join all believers in the struggle to find the meaning of God in our lives and how Christ works through us in our lives and in our world and our everyday encounters with humankind. Amen. Oh,